<laughs> okay, hello everyone and welcome to Faded Mates. I'm Jennifer Prokop, <laughs> romance reader and critic, and I'm here today interviewing my special guest, Sarah McLean. <laughs> Oh. I'm Sarah McLean, and for the purposes of today, I read romance novels and I write them. That's right. <laughs> Just like always. Same. Same as always. Same as always, except that it's bombshell week. <gasps> it's here. It is here. And so if you have been around, you know that when Sarah's new books come out, we have a episode where I get to interview Sarah like I don't know her and ask her about her book and have <laughs> you all hear about her book. Although I would like to say right off the top, no spoilers. Are there no spoilers? I think there's going to be no spoilers. I'm in charge. So I feel, I just want you all to know this will be safe for you to listen to, even if you have not had a chance to read it yet. Oh, wait. And I think we should tell everybody what they can find at the end of this episode. <gasps> yes. At the end of this episode, the first two chapters of the audiobook starring my bae, Mary Jane Wells, <laughs> um, are, yeah, going to be at the end of the episode. So it's terrific. I listened to it, and I love her. Oh, she's so good. You had told me, see, everybody knows, I think, that I don't listen in audio very much. And um, so I had never listened to a Mary Jane Wells book. And everybody, you and others have said to me, like, oh, she's just beyond. She's so good. And I was like, I mean, how, how beyond could she possibly be? And then I listened to the first chapter, which is actually the prologue of the book, and I was like, oh, oh, she's great. The way she does the kicker of the prologue, I was like, oh, she's good. She's a great narrator. <laughs> so I'm really excited. I mean, I, you know, it's nice to change it up. I liked your old narrator a lot, too, but, um, so, you know, no shade there, but it's nice to change it up, and she's terrific. So at the end, stick around, and you can hear the first two chapters of Bombshell in your ear holes as we like to say here. Yay. So, Sarah, tell us about Bombshell. Do the elevator pitch for us. Oh, God. (laughs) I was hoping you would do the elevator pitch for me. Um, Bombshell is the first book in my new series, Hell's Bells, uh, which is... we, We are now squarely in Victorian times, and it is about a Victorian era girl gang who basically kick ass and take names. The heroine is Cecily Talbot, who... Longtime McLean fans will recognize from an earlier series, but I don't think that matters. I think if you've never read a book by Sarah McLean, you can start here. It's a second chance romance, I think I'd sort of say. I don't know. These two have really wanted yes. each other. They have wanted to climb each other like trees for a while. Uh, yeah, they never had a first <laughs> chance, really. It's just been longing. So much so that one of them actually left the country for a while. <laughs> To resist tempting. All that pining. He couldn't actually climb or like a tree, so it was just pining. It was just pining. Um, so, but he happens, he's back. He's back uh, for a christening. Of course. <laughs> as a matter of fact. Of course. As one sure. is. Um, and uh, he he finds her doing crimes in the in the woods. <laughs> Which is how it should be. And there's my pitch. I, well done, Sarah. Hero- the heroine's doing crimes in the woods. <laughs> the hero wants her. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. I mean, really, honestly, what else? There's nothing more to say. Podcast over. But actually, it's, like, also a big book. The whole series is really about, like, this group of women who are awesome and have lots of special skills, a very particular set of skills. And um, they are able to set wrongs right. So we get to watch them do that. One of my favorite things is um, in the book when... Caleb sees them all in action at one point. He thinks it was a crew if he'd ever seen one. And I was like, yeah. (laughs) That's what I want, a crew. (laughs) Well, if you're going to get into a tavern brawl, I mean, I don't think it's too much of a spoiler. It happens very quick early in the book. But if you're you're going to get into a tavern brawl, you need a crew. The thing that at, at this scene is... When the tavern brawl happens, which is, again, pretty early, I texted Sarah as I was reading it that I 
I hadn't felt this much like glee <laughs> since watching the first Wonder Woman when all of the like Amazons are fighting and the mascara. That's how it feels, right? So <laughs> extreme high praise. Here. But and yeah. I, we're gonna talk about like why you know all we're gonna talk about kind of why the book is the way it is. Um, but one of the uh, questions I think is really interesting. So we started doing I think these episodes with probably Brazen. So we didn't with Wicked and the Wallflower, which is actually one of my favorites. So. Talk to us about how you conceive a series and how it fits into, like, what I've been calling, like, the McLean universe. The McLean universe. <laughs> okay, so I am, I think, unlike a lot of other writers, romance writers, in that when most, I, as I understand it, you know, we, whenever we sell a series for um, a contract to a traditional house. We think of it as like, it's going to be three books. And sometimes it's, it's just going to be three books. And sometimes it's, it's going to be three books and there's a family. So it'll be all the sisters. And sometimes it's, it's going to be, you know, a casino, for example, and it's going to be the four owners. And that's that. And, but for me, my books, my series usually stitch together a little more tightly than that. And so when I sell when I sold the casino series it was like there's going to be a casino and then at the end there's going to be a twist. So the fourth book will be a surprise for everyone who it is. Or when I did Scandal and Scoundrel and that was the the that was the first peek at the soiled S's Cecily the heroine of Bombshell is one of those sisters. I was like there are five sisters and The inciting incident of the entire series will actually be essential to the third book in the series. When I wrote Bare Knuckle Bastards, that was a really tightly woven. I wanted the whole thing to feel like a fairy tale. Um, So you, if you start the beginning of Wicked and the Wallflower, literally within like pages, you get the foreshadowing of what is going to happen at the very end of Daring and the Duke. And I think this series, so that was really about, like, fairy tales and, like, telling a larger kind of, like, epic story. Again, you could start anywhere in that series, I hope. But if you read them in order, there's some— More rewarding, There's maybe, a little right? more—yeah, a little, a little more fun, maybe. Um, with this series, I was like, I want it to feel like an action movie. Like, I want it to feel fun and rollicking, and I want it to feel like you are dropped down in this, like, fantasy world, almost, where these women have immense power and can change the world when they decide to. So, um, there is, it is conceived as four books, and there is, I know what happens at the end of the whole series. So, now I just have to get there. Well, that's always the challenge. And I think it's clear to me that there's still things you're discovering about these characters on the way, right? Of course. Well, that has to be. I mean, I've learned my lesson over the years that, like, you don't give away too much about a character early in in a book that's not theirs. Because when you get to their book, you might need everything to be a little different. Well, so that actually is a great question, which is you're now returning to characters that Caleb and Cecily that you last probably wrote about in 2016 because Day of the Duchess was published in 2017. So what's it like to return to these characters? Yeah, that is very real because Cecily... So um, Day of the Duchess is... Cecily was in the earlier books of the series, um, and she was kind of built as the the wild child of the sisters. So I knew that about her, you know, always. But by the time Day of the Duchess happened, she was also, Day of the Duchess is a very, it's probably my heaviest book in the sense that, like, it deals with a lot of grief and sorrow. And, like, there is, it is a, it is a book that is about, like, deep feelings between two people who are just, like, star-crossed in many ways. And um, Cecily was comic relief, in that book. And she, and so it was, I sort of had this clown who, and she's not comic relief the whole way through. There's, there are some moments where you see Cecily's like real humanity and like, you know, she's a person, a fully formed person. But coming to her book, suddenly there are, there are like codified things about Cecily that I had 
maybe forgotten. So I did go back and I reread just the parts with Cecily of those three books. Um, And like, for example, I had written maybe like, I don't know, two thirds of the book when I did this. And I remember, I had forgotten that Cecily was car sick. Oh yeah. She gets carriage sick all the time, right? She gets carriage sick. She gets violently carriage sick. And so I was like, Oh, <laughs> I can't, like, I can't wreck on that. Like, she has to get carriage yeah. sick. And she had been in carriages. So, um, you know, so there were things like that. But also Cecily and Caleb have this past. And the one thing that I do, if I could sort of, like, go back and switch it around, is the timing is really, like, I had to have him in London at very specific times because Caleb has been on the page in the last four books, you know, at times. There's this really, this is not a spoiler, but there's a really funny line in the book where he's talking to Serafina, I think, and she says something like, yeah, can you believe we're even like characters when you're not around on page? Like the sort of nod (laughs) to the fact that, you know, the way romance is built, right? Like, those characters are all still existing in their worlds. And the more convoluted and and complicated and complex your world becomes, yeah, who's keeping your series Bible, Sarah? (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. No one, and it's starting to become clear that (laughs) that that time is here. not the best plan for me. Because I also think there's that, too. I can't think of many other writers, aside from the big paranormal writers. And, like, obviously, I'm you, I mean, it's unsurprising to everybody that, like, my inspiration for the last three years has come a lot from Cressley. Right. Like, you know, doing that super deep dive on Cressley has really given me, like, a paranormal, a love of the structure of the paranormal. Of the world, right. Yeah. Yeah. But I can't think of that many writers who are doing this kind of, like, big universe right. work. Um, and that was never the intention, but now, it's of happening. course. Right. It's happening, and I love it. Like, it's really fun to be able to bring back, you know, there is a moment in 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 Bombshell, and I don't want to spoil it, where, like, you know, you see older characters, and you see, like, a very specific group of older characters, and it was really yes. fun to be like, who am I bringing back for, for this, this scene? scene? And to say, like, oh, it's, it's them. It's this group. Beverly Jenkins, maybe, I think, is a person who has a really, yes. right, like, her families and the world that they inhabit. But, and also, like, Stephanie Lawrence, I feel like, did yeah, this. Yeah, maybe, yeah. A little bit. Like, you still, even in her later books, you still see, like, you, you see the sisters made mention mm-hmm. of. But not as tightly, um, I think, as this, so. No, it's a very different kind of work when you're like, oh, no, it's going to stitch together. Like, this is happening in Covent Garden, and so the Bare Knuckle Bastards have to exist in this universe, Um, which is really fun. It is fun. A question, I think, and maybe we can, like, lay something to rest, which is there are characters who get their own books and there are characters who don't. Did you always know that you were, that they were going to get their own book? Were they always going to end up together? We've talked before about how much I love Lisa Kleypas' Again, the Magic, right? Um... And I, one of the things I love the most about that book is the secondary romance in it. Um, I love a secondary romance in most, in most books because um, I just like it when there's like something else going on. And I also think it's really beautiful when it's deftly connected, when it's like the needle is threaded through the main romance. Um, So they were intended, Cecily and Caleb were intended to be the secondary romance in Day of the Duchess. And again, it was the idea that there would be this like foil romance where it was just like two people who, you know, really just wanted each other and so went for it. And then it didn't finish in mm-hmm. the book. And I was like, oh, like, this is interesting because it's not, it's bigger than what I thought it was going to be. And that sounds sort of silly to people who aren't writers, I guess. But, um, you know, sometimes you just, like, have a plan and then it just (laughs) all falls apart at the end. Um, And so I had intended then to give them a Christmas novella. And I actually wrote in the author's note of Day of the Duchess, like, stay tuned. They're definitely coming. (laughs) I mean... And then it was, then a little bit, for a little bit of time, it was, like, just timing. Like, my dad died, and there was, like, it just, it was rough in terms of, like, finding the time to do it. And then in between Wicked and the Wallflower and Brazen and the Beast, I had the idea for Hell's Bells. And I was like, okay, 
who are these women? I knew eventually I was going to put these women into the Bare Knuckle Bastards. Like, Lay those seeds, right. You will recognize the Duchess of Treviscan, who is, you know, the the kind of ringleader of, of the Bells, is in Day of the Duchess, and an important piece of the Day of the Duchess stitching together. And so um, I knew that was going to happen, and then I sort of thought, okay, well, who are they all? And I had Cecily, this, like, wild child who was aging, right? Like, she, I knew she was going to be 30 at least by the time I got to the Bells. And then I was like, oh, well, she's obviously the, like, she doesn't give a fuck. Yeah. <laughs> <So> like, <laughs> she has zero fucks to give. And, like, she will be a perfect kind of bombshell heroine who... You know, she's a femme fatale. You know, so I started you and I, you yes. knew that I was watching all these like movies that were about yeah. gangs, like gangs of people working together. I think like the influence of like pop culture, right? So Sarah and I watched the A Team one night and it was like, it was great. It was mid pandemic. And I was like, Jen, I have to watch the, I have to for work. <laughs> and I was like, well, I obviously have to watch it with you, right? Be a te- you know what you can do these days. But it wasn't for, like, the plot. It's for the banter, right? So, yeah, it's for the sense of, and also about character, right? Like, look, the A-Team is, is it a great movie? Yes. Not really. Listen. <laughs> yeah, I sure. mean, for Jen, beautiful people Blue, blowing yeah, shit listen, up. Listen, I'm a simple yes. woman. It was a great movie. <laughs> um, but, like, all these movies about, like, gangs of people, right, doing stuff. Like, all the heist movies. All the, oh, I love those Oceans movies. Like, Because when you have a crew, everyone has to be competent. Everyone has to have their task and their job and their thing that they are good at. And at the end, they all have to trust that, like, each of the pieces will work. And I think that large groups of very beautiful, um, competent people are Oh, me too. Very appealing. (laughs) My kink. Right? Very appealing. (laughs) Especially when they're like doing crime. Yeah. Well, and it's but it's and like good crime, crime right? Like, like crime. very Robin Hood esque in that way, right? Yeah. Like the truth is, is that the the you know dominant forces in society are not going to take care of many of us the way that we can take care of ourselves. Yeah. And that's a big through line in the book. Obviously, that's not a spoiler, and will surprise no one. No. Can we go? I want to go talk about Caleb and Cecily a little bit more because. I'm really curious about, I mean, you talked about writing Cecily. How was writing Caleb? I mean, also your first American, really. Yeah, so that was interesting. There were a couple of moments where um, my very dear friend, Louisa uh, Edwards, who many of you will remember from um, her amazing chef romances, um, read an early draft of it, and a couple of times she was like, um... This dude does not, he sounds English. Like, <laughs> right. this, like she was like circling lines going like, this feels English. This feels English. So um, that was, it was interesting to like sort of shift mindset a little bit. Um, although he has spent a lot of time in England. So like, right. <laughs> there were definitely moments where I was like, this is okay. There was also a moment where I like called Joanna Shoup in like, a flat spin about, like, what clothes he would be wearing. Like, I was like, oh, my God, he's not dressed the way I think he's dressed. What were Americans wearing? (laughs) (laughs) And Joanna was like, I got you. Perfect. Thank you. (laughs) So, like, um, so bless my friends. Um, But also Caleb was, again, in Duchess, he was, like, the even kind of, like, he's Serafina's best friend. He is her sounding board in a lot of ways because she feels so disconnected from her family for lots of reasons. Like, there's a lot of animosity. Not animosity, but there's a lot of, again, sorrow between her and her sisters in that book. So, like, he is her person. And so he's kind of... When it came time for him to be a hero, like, he still had to be a McLean hero, which meant that he had to have some, like, (laughs) devastating backstory. (laughs) Well done. It's really good, you guys. That was going to make him feel like he just wasn't worthy of love, which is basically my whole kink. (laughs) I was talking to Caroline Linden this week, and I was like, listen, all I want is for them to be, like, crawling on broken glass because they just don't think they're good enough. And she was like, I guess you do. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, you did you, and it was great. Um, but I think even though that is like pretty common, I do still think Cecily and Caleb felt different. She felt she had her secrets and her um, her worries, too, even though she comes from a big, loving family. So what do you think they're exploring in their relationship that readers will relate to? As extra as these characters are, like, Hell's Bells, I feel like, it's... It's fantasy you know, on steroids yes. a little. Like there's just there's so much going on and it I hope it will feel very fast and fun and you'll feel a little bit yeah. like, you know, you're in this wild world with them. But I actually think Caleb and Cecily are pretty ordinary. Like it, at their core, right? They're like two decent people like just trying to be decent in the world. Um and I think that's also the difference between Caleb and a lot of my earlier heroes at least is like he is First of all, he's a true, like, he's a he's a commoner. I mean, he's an American on top of being, you know, a, he, he doesn't, he's not a secret, you know, right. dude. <laughs> he's just a right. guy. And there, so there is both freedom in that, in that, like, he doesn't have the burden of, I don't know, title, re, like, you know, name. Reputation. All of that stuff that I, yeah, that I, I've sort of kind of worked through we talked when we mm-hmm. talked about day of the duchess the, uh, day of the duchess um daring in the duke daring in the duke that like i was kind of done with you know the family burden mm-hmm. although it feels like with the duke of claiborne you might be willing to tee that back up <laughs> <sighs> i mean he's a real crusty he's gonna be i would assume he's in book two right with he's adelaide's yeah. hero yes so he's book two which has a title, I guess I can share Well, it. yeah, so, uh, although I'm like, you know, <laughs> wait, we should wait. That's, I have, I have <laughs> a title question end. later. Yeah, it's fine. Come yeah. back to it. So this actually does kind of relate, right? Like, you're, as an author, and, you know, I said this, like, moving away kind of from ballrooms, there, I don't think is, all the ballroom scenes in this book are very unlike other ballroom scenes. The ballroom scenes serve a purpose in this book that's yes. different. Like, they're, they're for access to information and power. Right, as a, right. Which, I mean, I guess is how ballrooms... Probably are, but it's... Probably are, it's, but... It's different, though. Nobody's trying to get married in these right. ballrooms. Right, it's really different. But I also was thinking, and you've talked about this, with Bare Knuckle Bastards, it was like entire books just took place at night. Right? Mm-hmm. And this, I think, is the very similar in this book in some ways, right? Like, there are these key scenes that take place at night, but it's not as... Like, not in the same way. It feels like you're really more judicious as a way of, like, using, like, the setting as kind of showing women's power. And so I'm wondering if, like, what do you gain or what do you are, like, conspicuously sort of choosing not to include in your books when you um, are using, like, the time and space in such a different way? Wow, Jen, that's a very smart question. Am I smart enough to answer that question? <laughs> I think you are. Um, you know, I really like playing. I really like a setting. I was just saying, I think, oh, I wish more authors would pay attention to setting. I think it does a lot more than people think it does. My editor also edits Lisa mm-hmm. Klepus and Susan Elizabeth Phillips and Elisa James. And, and we, so we often, and she has been around for a long time. We've often said we wanted to have her on yeah. the podcast and we should. Um, she's edited a lot of like the big names of the, of the genre over the last, you know, 30 years. And we, so we talk often about like, what are the hallmarks of, of authors? What are the things authors do well? Um, and she has, she and I have always talked about like setting as being like my, thing like um and there's usually like a huge set piece in a book um and in this in this book there's the Mm -hmm. place right which I assume we'll talk about or I hope we'll talk about um which is the tavern that where the the hell's bells hang out it's basically like you know it's it's the joint the hangout spot um and um so for me setting is really important um time is really important because when you when you choose settings when you make space for a a group of characters and i often do this um you're making a space where they feel ownership over the place and so um in that in in doing that you're giving over power to the char- you're you're ceding power to the characters right to say things that they maybe wouldn't it it gives it gives them an opportunity to be themselves 
in ways that like a ballroom does not do. And also time, you know, night is, for me, night is where freedom happens. Night is where, you know, we are, we're able to like really, like the darkness is, it closes everything out. And so it's just you and the other person who you can see, um, or you and the thing that you are trying to do clandestinely. Um, but this book actually is one of the few books I think I've ever written where there's like an actual pretty intense sex scene, like during the yes. day, like just like in the light. And um, I think for Cecily and Caleb, that was really important that it be mm-hmm. in daytime, that they have this time where they see each other in the world out loud, so to speak. Yeah. Um, because I think for both of them, it is important that their identities be seen by the other person, that there are no shadows, there are no secrets, um, because they both feel in some way kind of flawed. One of the things that you started to, I think, really unpack in Bare Knuckle Bastards, but even in, in the Casino series, is like sort of a continuing conversation about the importance of women's spaces and the danger those pose to the patriarchy. Mm. Not and I, I when I first was thinking about this question, it was sort of like to men, but it's like it's the patriarchy itself, right? Yeah. It's so patriarchy. how when you think about the place, when you think about um, you know this cottage that they're in, when you think about, I mean, you know, there's a, a scene where Cecily's with her sisters and their children. Um, you know, how do you think about developing? the different places that women do exist in your worlds yeah. and why those are seen as dangerous. You know, romance, I've said this a thousand times on the podcast, but romance is such a domestic genre in the sense that, like, often when we write heroines, when we write, like, cis het romance, we're writing um, heroines who hold power in families, heroines who hold power in, like, private space, What is what is considered to be private space, right? The mm-hmm. home certainly in historicals this is true like they hold space in places that are quote for women so like the home the you know the dressmaker shop the you know the ballroom is the reason why the ballroom is such an important setting in historicals is because it is a place where women reign Mm -hmm. right like men have a lot less power in a ballroom which is why in those old historicals we would see like the women running the show in the ballroom and then there was always like the game of cards that was in the quiet room like down the hallway that was where men held power and this was where women did and I don't want that for women <laughs> in the world. Like, cause I think we still feel yeah, that way absolutely. Often, like, in the world in 2021. Like we, we talk about like emotional work and the, the work of being a woman in the world is so much about like when the doors close, that's where our power lies. And like, fuck that a little bit. Like we should get to have, you know, the place in the tavern that makes that gives us safety and comfort and a place that we can protect right like should it be threatened like we should have the power to protect our spaces we should be able to you know drive our carriages without you know having people worry about it like there and what was happening this is a really fun time to be writing too because what is about to happen a early victorian time had this like real sense of hope for women i think because there was a queen on the throne, and then it changes. Yeah, and I really wanted to actually to talk about this because I think there's something really interesting that happens, which is you see, and I, you know, I understand that like the regency is like ten years, but sometimes yeah, readers but say for our purposes it's, it's forever, right? <laughs> but sometimes exactly. when people say Are they wearing a dress, it's exactly, the <laughs> and so sometimes you'll see historical readers say, "I only read regencies." And then I'm kind of like, well, you don't like Lisa Claypis? And they're like, no, I love her. But I was like, okay, but she's writing well into the Victorian era. So you make a point of actually naming that it's Victorian, right? That Victoria has, uh, like, risen up to the throne. But so, Mm -hmm. you know, do, do a little historical primer for us. Because even though, you know, you and I are pretty clear that, like, historical romance isn't historical fiction. Like, you still obviously are doing a lot of work about, like, what did the, what was... What did people, women maybe especially, hope was going to happen in the Victorian yeah. era versus what really did? Yeah, so the so the Regency happened, and um, the Regency was actually really, like, freewheeling. Um, there was a lot of freedom for the clothing was, you know, less constrictive. Like, you can just think, you know, 
if you if you don't know much about historicals, like you probably saw Bridgerton, right? Like the clothes right. are, you know, the boobs are very <laughs> tight. But other than that, there's like a lot of movement. Um, there aren't necessarily corsets in the Regency. That's sometimes like so if you literally the clothing is a good way to explain how the world is changing. Um, and then like literally <laughs> Corsets happen and bodices tighten, and it's almost as though like society is like is constricting women via. Well, it is they're constricting women via, via clothing, but then it's also made plain through in clothing. The world. Right. So the queen, Queen Victoria, ascends to the throne in the 1830s, and it is a absolute disaster for men. Like they think. Men think, like, this is, well, this is the end of the world. <laughs> right. I mean, like, clear, clearly we cannot survive a woman on the throne. And so for the first, like, she doesn't, she becomes queen when she's very young. Um, and there's sort of a sense of, well, um, maybe she could just surround herself with, like, male advisors. Um, advisors. And then basically, like, men will run the show anyway. Um, but you can't deny that having a female monarch, right, was powerful in the sense that like women looked to Buckingham Palace which was you know recently built and like suddenly there was this sense of like there is a woman on the throne which means like if she can be queen there like we can maybe have power here and so there was a very real sense of hope and I think it does map in many ways to the world that we live in now where You know, there was Barack Obama, Mm -hmm. and so we thought, oh, my God, like, maybe everything's different now. And then Hillary Clinton ran for president, and we thought, holy crap, this is going to be amazing. And I remember, like, those tweets where it was, like, all white men and then, like, a black man and then a woman. And we were like, it's going to happen. Like, it's happening. And then it didn't happen. It sure didn't. And yeah. I think, and so what happens with Victorian history is that pretty quickly, like within a few years, it becomes very clear that men are deeply threatened by the idea that women would get ideas. (laughs) And just because, you know, this one woman was literally selected by God (laughs) to be queen of England does not mean the rest of you should have any ideas. Should start thinking with your brains. Um, And that has to have been enraging, right? I mean... Well, it feels enraging now. I mean, I know how enraging it is. Yeah. Like, I... And we do have power, right? Like, I don't have to wear a corset and, like, you know, go everywhere with a chaperone. I mean, I'm a little (laughs) older than that anyway. Well, but... But, like, you know... This is still something... I mean, I can go into bars and, like you know, whatever, do, I have lots and lots of freedoms, um, but I'm furious a lot of the time. Yeah. But I didn't want this book to be mad. I wanted it to be, like, ready to change the world. So why is it then important for you that you write women who fight? And sometimes I, like, literally mean that physically, like fist fighting and tavern brawling. But... Well, everyone knows I love a fight, right? So... I mean... Surprising no one. There are lots of fights. In but there's book. also lots of conversation in the book about, like, how different women's ways of fighting are than mm-hmm. the patriarchy's way of fighting. The weapons that these women, the, the, the bells, although they are not called the bells at the beginning of the book, they this is their origin story. The weapons that the bells use are myriad. And there is, you know, they can get it done as well with a table leg as they can with, you know— a room full of servants, right? right? And so there is a sort of sense of power on many levels. And and I wanted it to feel like at any point, and this comes from the idea of, I wanted it to feel like, you know, the Avengers in the sense that like literally whatever the task Mm -hmm. is, these women are capable of doing it. Like, um, and so that means they have the a- they have access to like physical prowess, like physical power. Um, Cecily is a known kind of femme fatale. I mean, she's she is literally nicknamed by the by the aristocracy sexily because she doesn't wear the same fashions that everyone else wears. Like she knows how to make herself look like a bombshell. Yeah. And she presumably is seducing men all the time, 
we learn that, like, she just knows how to use her. She is using the tools at her disposal to get shit done. Um, And then there's, you know, but each of them has skills, right? Adelaide, I don't want to give too much away about Adelaide's backstory, but Adelaide's a consummate mm-hmm. thief. Like, she is extremely good at stealing things. Um, Emma Chin is a scientist who, like, will blow shit up if you make her mad. Or maybe not. Maybe she's not mad. Yeah, like, there's a great <laughs> scene where, like... Cecily looks across the room at her and she's like talking and then like gives like Cecily's like, you know, like sort of the universal language for like, boom. (laughs) (laughs) And then there's the Duchess who just like has information and like is able to use it at any point. And so these, this is all able to be used to fight. It's anytime they need to defend themselves or defend others or, take power or hold power, they now have, with those four skills, they have the power to do a number of different things. Well, and I think there's also a really interesting escalation. So, you know, Grace can fight in Bare Knuckle Bastards, but there's a lot of conversation in this book about battling. Yeah. It's war. Yes, right. So this escalation from a skirmish to a battle is one, Mm -hmm. too, where we see that they're, they have a bigger task as well, I guess I would say. It's clear from this book. I'm really interested to see how it all plays out. Yeah, me too. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, but there's a lot of suddenly, I mean, there is a moment, and you know that I feel this way about my books, like often is like if I start to feel nervous or like fearful of the idea, I know that's the right mm-hmm. path. And so things like, I mean, I, it will not come as a surprise that, like, Scotland Yard is involved in this book. I mean, like, these women are committing crimes. crimes. Right. Um, so Scotland Yard exists in this book, and it's the first time I've ever actually, like, well, first of all, the Metropolitan Police are fairly mm-hmm. new, right? So historically, there is sometimes, like, history just serves, it just, it's a little gift to you. Like, I... I mean, I would have had to do a lot more heavy lifting if, like, I had to explain why Scotland Yard didn't exist 10 years earlier in this book. But, like, it didn't. And so, so fine. Right. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, the, but Scotland Yard is fairly new. So there is, um, there is a detective inspector. Is he going to end up with Imogen? I mean. Literally, the minute his name was on page, I was like, oh. <laughs> Hello, sir. <laughs> I'm going to pay attention to you. Wait, can we tell everybody about how you text me and you were like, does the Duchess get a book? And no, I was like, I said, does she get a name? Because does she get a she's name? She's only Duchess in this book. Oh, right? Well, I mean, she's only Duchess. Yeah. And yeah. you were like, dummy. She does. And I was like, okay, but you can tell me her name, right? <laughs> no, she did not. She does not have a name as of yet, but she is, she's Duchess. I mean, she's, yeah. the, she's the queen at this yeah. point. Um, anyway, but so Scotland Yard's here, which means I'm going to have to deal with a police yeah. force. That is going to be a thing. Right. You know, like there's, I mean, and then ultimately there's this idea of like this, I'm very, I'm, I mean, I have, I have the plan. It's just, can I execute it? You can, Sarah. Here's my like follow-up question to kind of that, which is, I think a really glib thing people say is like, oh, if only women ruled the world, <laughs> like, none of these yeah. problems would exist. So how do you think this book is specifically addressing, like, the actual complexities of women in power? Yeah, I mean, I think this is really interesting because women, white women particularly, um, don't like to have their power threatened, right? We've When you claim space, when it feels as though space is so limited to you, then your claiming of space almost turns you into an oppressor, right? Because, like, right. then you don't want anybody to take your right. space. Like, this, this is mine. Is um, so I've been very careful. I'm very I, – I was very careful to, to think about how the Bells claim space and also share it, like, offer it up to other people. And Aware of the fact that, like, also when you're writing a book about the 1830s in London, there is so much class that has to be dealt with, too. Right. Right? Like, some of the bells are powerful 
because the, Cecily, for example, is beautiful. She's rich. She's the child of an earl. Like, yes, she's a scandal. But, you know, each one of her sisters is married to an incredibly powerful man. And so, like, she has a layer of protection that, for example, Adelaide, who is not titled and does not come from a titled family, does not have. And so, like, I was really careful about how I drew these characters out, though readers won't see the The final result for a while. Um, But also, Queen Victoria is terrible eventually. Like, she does the very most to keep women down. So this idea of being betrayed by other women is rough for me. Like there is it is it's it is in it has to be coded into these stories, but man I hate it. I hate it because I feel like we should all be better about seeing that like as Adriana likes to say like we either all rise or none of us do. It's clear to me that that's coded in from the beginning, um, but it yeah. is a it's a silly idea, right? To to think, oh, if you know, all women are yes. great and all men are terrible, right. and right. and that's not it. The trick with these books is very like, and I feel like my books have really moved in this direction. The the seed has always been there from the beginning, but these heroes, I mean, Caleb especially. I felt like he was, like, a leap for me in a lot of ways because, like, talk about a dude who, like, had to learn to be a partner Mm -hmm. and, like, seed power in a lot of ways. Like, that's Caleb's, Caleb's, like, arc here is, like, becoming a bell in a lot of ways and understanding that, like, to be a bell, he has to take a back seat. Yeah, And also I wanted it to, I wanted that female friendship. I wanted him to honor that friendship, like... The worst story is when it's, and we've all seen this happen in our yes. real lives, right? Where like somebody meets a man and then suddenly like they don't have time that's for That's the pair right. and like friends are secondary. And um I think what you will see is a real like heroine's journey kind of thing here where like the bells get bigger and bigger and it's because of partners. Yeah. So I have a craft question for you. One of the things Oof. that I think of as being um, a real hallmark of your style is that you really have found a way to put on page characters in conversations with themselves through italics, basically. So characters are saying one thing but thinking another. I love a liar. Yeah, but I think it 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 also feels very real. So yeah, how has this evolved in your craft, and what do you think it adds to the text? I think I'm probably more judicious of my italics now than I was mm. at the beginning oh, of my career. Oh, interesting. Okay. I think I think um I think I used to really love this as a stylistic. And I think this happened. I mean, this feels like a real a rom- honest. Yeah. I mean, like a, aside from like the italics being a romance tool, I think all writers like find a thing that they really like to do and then maybe like overuse it while they're learning they love right. it and then like learn like okay, This is what I love about it. This is how it works. And now I'm going to pull back. So I think I'm slightly more judicious about italics now now than I was. Um, But I also think um, I really like, I like a lot, like I said, I love a liar. Love a liar. Um, I especially like heroes who are liars because, as we all know, I love heroes who refuse to acknowledge their feelings. Um, and so there's that, but also I think, um, it's important to the reader to see when a character is listening to themselves and when they are not, right? Like there's an honesty that comes with whatever's be- whatever's happening in the italics and often, um, that's happening early in, early in a story and then by the And so the reader can sort of sense, like, oh, she's lying to herself more than... Like, she's saying it to herself, but, like, refuses to hear it. Because I think we are all kind of constantly questioning ourselves. I think it's more so for Caleb in in this text than Cecily, this sort of... Mm -hmm. Well, Cecily knows herself. There are very few things Cecily doesn't know about herself. So it's really a part of his character, but 
remember that sex scene you mentioned during the daytime. It's not there at all. Yeah. And so you really get this sense of, like, when he is, like, sort of in alignment with himself versus when he's fighting himself. And I just thought it was right. really effective here. But I think it's effective... Until I feel like at the very end of that sex scene, yeah, there's a right. moment. Yeah, right, because then he scares himself again. Yeah. Feelings. <laughs> okay, well, we're we're close to wrapping up. I do want to talk about the title. I want to talk about Bombshell because, as Susan Elizabeth Phillips pointed out, this is, you know, out of the current territory of romance naming historical yeah, conventions. The Duke and right. the ditzy right. dork. Whatever. Although <laughs> yesterday I was at Love Sweet Arrow and I bought Sophie Jordan's new book, The Duke Goes Down. Oh, the Duke Goes and Down. I was like, how, ex- how did they let her get away with this? But I don't care. Amazing. I love it. So talk about Bombshell and then I think we or maybe you can reveal... Yeah, and I'll reveal the title for the next book. Um, So, (sighs) all my series have titles that are in alignment, Mm -hmm, right? right. Like, there's, and I knew, I mean, we had gone around and around on the titles for Baron Uncle Bastards. Like, Wicked Mm -hmm. and the Wallflower had about 17 working titles before we got to, all right, they're all going to be these and the concepts um and then you know prior to that I had done you know I was really big I was like the idiom person right right? and then before that I mean nine rules to break when romancing a rake had this like long silly (laughs) numbered writing title um so there's so I knew I wanted this series to feel different like Mm -hmm. I said I wanted it to have its own identity I wanted it to feel like tight and quick and um fast paced and really fun like I wanted you to feel like when you open this book you were just like diving into something new um something that maybe you hadn't read since you were you know in a long time like Mm -hmm. this is like I wanted to feel fresh and so I mean we we did a lot uh we had a ton of like what about this what about this what about this and then finally I just kept coming back to like one words right um like those old Amanda Quicks yes ravished like and one word titles are really like they weren't they're it's very rare in historicals right now yeah. to find a one-word title. Um, and so, uh, but then, of course, it was like, well, it can't be ravished because Amanda Quick right. had that. <laughs> Done. <laughs> yeah. What is it? And then I was like, oh, it's words that are weaponized, yeah. right? Like, it's words that shouldn't be weaponized against women but yeah. are. And um, so there are four titles. Three of them are for sure, and the final one is in constant. There are a couple of options. Um, But Bombshell was very clear from the start. I was like, it's obviously Bombshell. That's clearly what Cecily is. is. That's the role Cecily plays. Um, And then my my editor, and I sort of was like, but is it too modern? Like, are we going to get the knock from historical readers that, like, this isn't even a modern word? In actual fact, it's an incredibly old sure. word, which I didn't expect either. I thought it was going to be, you know, from the early 1900s, but it's not. It's, like, from the 1500s or somewhere. Um, but so that was it. We just knew. Mm-hmm. Like, and I said, I texted my editor sort of thinking, like, oh, she's going to hate it. And she literally texted back, like, I'm putting it in the system right now. Like, and then I was like, oh, shit, <laughs> I need to come up with three more. Right. Um, so... The order of the books, I think I can say this now, is Cecily, and then Adelaide, and then Imogen, and then Duchess, who does have a name, but not right Fine. now. And, um, she <laughs> and then, um, Im- well, Jen, you do you want to tell everybody that you just have retconned uh, Imogen's name to be spelled I-M-O-J-E-N? Obviously. I mean, I just assumed everybody <laughs> figured that out already. Imogen! <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next book is Adelaide and the Duke of Claiborne, um, named affectionately for my friend Kate sure. Claiborne. Um, and it's called Heartbreaker. Heartbreaker. So, and Adelaide is very fun. And the Duke of Claiborne is 
Very grumpy. Grumpy sunshine. <laughs> always a classic. I, I have so. one last cr- question to, like, wrap up, which is um, you wrote this book during a pandemic. Yeah. Just, did. <laughs> you did. So did. how was your determination to let it be fun or different or an escape it just feels obvious to me, but, I mean, was that always the case, I mean, or was that because of where we are? Yeah. yeah. I mean, from the yeah. start, I was like, it has to. I mean, when I conceived of the series, I was like, it has to be fun, right? Like, it has to be. If it's a girl game, yeah. like, they have to be really fun. But then, you know, lockdown happened, and we were all trapped in our houses, and I missed my friends yeah. so much. Yeah. And I felt like, like, all the fun times that you have with when you're with your girls, like, I couldn't have those. So I was writing. I mean, I could have written every scene in this book in the place. Right. The tavern right. that they are in. I mean, I just, I wanted it to give readers a sense of community. I wanted it to welcome readers into the bells. Like, you all get to be bells, too. Right. In a lot of ways. Um, And then also, I wanted it to feel really fun. Like, I'm tired of serious. I feel like news is so serious and the world is so serious. And my every day feels very serious. And I I know we, you know, talked last summer about joy Mm -hmm. being like a driving, a guiding principle of the podcast. But like... I want it to be a guiding principle of my books, too. And I think, like, my books have given people a lot of joy. And I'm very, I'm so grateful to readers for all of the notes about them. But what I really hope is that, like, you open Bombshell, you are having fun from the first second that you are on the page in Voxel Gardens with Cecily. And then you are, you just, like, have, you can't put it down because it's just, like, a ride. Like, I want, at the end, I want you to feel like you have gone on a ride. Well, and I think the the scenes in Vauxhall Garden, it's a lot of magic. And it felt like a very different prologue. Maybe that's like a, well, this is a good place to end, because then you can just listen to the prologue as this ends. But, you know, it opens with magic and mystery. And I found myself really thinking, like, Unlike, say, the Bare Knuckle Bastards, with, which opened with this, like, sort of fairy tale that was almost like a cautionary tale, like a, a true Grimm's fairy tale, mm-hmm. this yeah. felt like you were really setting the stage for, no, it's, it's a, carnival. a carnival. Like, yeah. we're, you're, you know, come on this ride with us. Follow the lady in the stilts. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, just go for it. We have, like, I have a path for you. Trust me. And we'll walk it together. And so you should just keep listening. Get on the path. (laughs) Cecily. Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens. October 1836. When the stilt walker approached, Cecily Talbot realised someone was toying with her. She should have noticed immediately when she'd stepped off the boat and through the river gate to the Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens, when the dancer dressed as an enormous peacock, brilliantly coloured tail feathers spread wide as a Marlebin row house, caught her on her way off the beaten path and pulled her, instead, to the dancing grounds. Not this path, lady, the beautiful bird had whispered before tugging her into a wild spinning reel. Cecily had never been one to refuse a dance and she'd happily followed her new feathered friend. When the jig left her breathless and heated, despite the cool October night, she'd peeled away from the entertainment and headed for somewhere quieter, somewhere to hold her solitude, keep her secrets. Cecily hadn't made it more than a minute into the darkness when the fire-eater found her, blocking the path that twisted and turned beneath a web of tight ropes high above, luring revellers further into the salacious extravagance of the gardens. Red paper lanterns glowed with delicious temptation behind the performer, who blocked Cecily's way, her face painted white like a clown's, bright blue eyes twinkling as she drew close to her torch and set the inky black night aflame. Cecily knew her role, and didn't hesitate to ooh and ah, letting the fire-eater take her hand with a deep curtsy and a charming, not this path, lady. 
She led Cecily back to the light, away from the route she'd sought. Cecily should have noticed then that she was a pawn. No, not a pawn, a queen, but played nonetheless. She didn't notice. And later she would wonder at her ignorance in the moment, rare for her 28 years, rare for someone who revelled in knowing the score, rare for someone who had made a life's work of winning the room, spinning the spinners. Instead, Cecily Talbot spent the next hour being spun herself, feared by a fortune teller, entertained by a pair of mimes, amused by a bawdy puppet show. And every time she tried to find a new path, one that led deeper into the gardens, away from the formal performance and toward the kind of entertainment that made for gossip and scandal and something to keep her mind from the emptiness in her chest, she was intercepted, ever waylaid from more reckless adventures. Adventures more suited to her reputation. Cecily Talbot, walking scandal, buxom beauty, untethered heiress and queen of recklessness who most of London called sexily when they thought she wasn't listening, as though it was a bad thing. At 28 years, Cecily was the second oldest and only unmarried daughter of wealthy baseborn Jack Talbot, a coal miner who'd pulled himself up through the soot to win a title from the Prince Regent in a game of cards. As if that weren't enough, the newly minted Earl of White set about wreaking common havoc on the aristocracy, his flamboyant wife and five dangerous daughters in tow. Daughters who'd scandalised society right up until they'd made enviable society matches. Serafina, Cecily, Celeste, Celine and Sophie. The soiled S's, named for the coal dust they'd been born into, now reigning over London as a duchess, a marchioness, a countess and the wife of the wealthiest horse breeder in Britain. And then there was Cecily who'd spent a decade flouting tradition and title and rules, and the most dangerous of the daughters. Because she had no interest in the games the aristocracy played. She did not concern herself with fabricated opponents who glared at her from the opposite ends of ballrooms. She did not have the same goals as the rest of society. Reckless Cecily. She did not relegate herself to the shelf of spinsterhood, nor to the outer edges of Mayfair, where the aged and ruined lived out their days. Wild Cecily. Instead, she remained rich and titled and merry, with seemingly no interest in the opinions of those around her, unwilling to be tamed by mother, sister, companion or community. Scandalous Cecily. Censure did not take, nor contempt, nor disapproval which left the aristocracy no choice but to accept her. Bored, Cecily. Not bored. Not that night. Boredom might have brought her to Vauxhall, but not alone. She'd have come with a friend, with a dozen of them. She'd have come for raucous entertainment and a whisper of trouble, but nothing like what she wanted that evening. Nothing like what clawed at her, making her want to seek out the worst kind of trouble, tempt it, scream at it. Frustrated, Cecily. Angry, Cecily. Embarrassed, Cecily. In the worst possible way, by a man. A tall, broad, green-eyed, irritating man in shirt sleeves and waistcoat, and maybe a silly American-style hat that didn't at all suit in Mayfair, but was distractingly good at revealing the angle of an altogether too square jaw. Far too square. Unrefined in the extreme the only man she'd ever wanted and couldn't win. So much for sexily. But she absolutely refused to suffer her disappointments in public. That was the kind of thing other people did, not Cecily. Cecily Talbot picked herself up, painted her face, and went to Vauxhall. Of course, if she weren't so busy suffering that particular evening's disappointment in private, she would have noticed that she was being watched and manoeuvred, and guided long before the stilt walker stepped out of the shadows of the tall trees lining the path that led to the rear section of Vauxhall, the dark walk. In the decade that Cecily had attended Vauxhall, the majority of visits had involved slipping the notice of parent, chaperone, sister or friend, and darting down the ever-darkening path to the place where events moved from performed to private 
away from fireworks and circus acts and hot air balloons to something more improper, something that might be considered sordid. In all those years, she'd never once seen a performer this far along the path, this deep into the darkness. Certainly not as the clock neared midnight on the last week of the Vauxhall season, when the lateness of the hour did nothing to lessen the number of people in the gardens, and performers should be occupied with entertaining throngs of revellers, marvelling at the sheer lush temptation of the place. And yet, there'd been a dancer and a fire-eater, and now there was a stilt-walker, with her enormous wig, and her extreme maculage, and her delighted smile, and not this path, lady! And that's when Cecily knew. She pulled up short, tilting to look up at the performer high above her, somehow impossibly dressed in massive, magnificent skirts, skirts that would threaten to fell a perfectly ordinary woman on her own two feet. Not any paths tonight, though, is it? A big laugh, made bigger as it rained down upon Cecily in the darkness, carried on the cool autumn breeze and punctuated by the bright fireworks that had begun in another part of the gardens, summoning the masses to marvel at them. Cecily was not interested in the sky. Or is there a different path for me tonight? The laugh became a knowing smile, and the stilt walker turned away. There was no question that Cecily would follow, suddenly imagining herself an arrow loosed from a bow, away from the target she'd chosen, and instead aimed for somewhere else. Something else. And though anger and frustration, and that thing she would not ever admit to feeling, still burned hot in her breast, Cecily could not help her own smile. She was no longer bored. Not as she followed the giantess through the trees to a light in the distance that flickered and glowed brighter and brighter, until they came upon a clearing where Cecily had never been before. There, on a raised platform, stood a magician, and one with no small amount of skill considering the way she defied the fireworks in the sky and held the rapt attention of the audience clustered tightly around her as she levitated a hound before their eyes. The magician's gaze found the stilt walker and slid instantly to Cecily, not a flicker of surprise in her eyes as she completed the trick and released the hound with a wave of her hand and a bit of dried meat. Wild applause exploded through the clearing as she took her bow deep and grateful, honouring the truth of all artists, that they were nothing without audience. The audience returned to the evening. They rushed to find another spectacle more urgent than usual, driven by the knowledge that they had scant hours before the gardens closed for the season. Within moments, Cecily was alone in the clearing, with the magician and her hound. The stilt walker somehow disappeared into the night. My lady, the magician said, her easy Italian accent filling the space between them, the honorific clear as the night sky. She knew who Cecily was. She'd been waiting for her, just as they all had that evening. Welcome. Cecily approached, curiosity consuming her. I see now that I've not been making the night difficult. You've been holding me at bay until you had time for me. Until we could give you the time you deserved, my lady. The magician bowed extravagant and low, collecting a small gilded box from the ground and setting it at the centre of the table between them. Cecily smiled, looking to the dog at the magician's feet. I was very impressed with your performance. I don't suppose you'll tell me how the illusion works. The woman's gold-green eyes glittered in the lantern light. Magic. She was younger than Cecily had first believed, a dark hood having hidden what she now recognised as a pretty fresh face, the kind that most definitely turned heads. As someone who prided herself on her own ability to turn heads, Cecily admired the woman's unique beauty. Of course, she hadn't been able to turn the only head she'd ever really cared to turn. She'd so failed to turn that head, it was on a boat to Boston that very moment. She pushed the thought out of her mind. You had them all enraptured. The world enjoys a spectacle, the magician replied. And in the spectacle, they failed to see the truth. Cecily knew that better than most. Therein lies the business, the woman said, opening the box, a collection of silver rings winking at her. Shall I show you another trick? Of course, Cecily replied, 
flashing a bright smile to hide the immediate pounding of her heart. Earlier that day, she'd felt herself on a precipice, at one of the rare moments in life when a body knew there would be a before and an after. But that had been a feeling in her heart, one that would wane, quiet, until the moment would fade and she'd struggle to remember the details. That had been emotion. This, this was in her head. This was truth. She did not hesitate, putting her hand into the empty box, her fingers brushing across the firm, smooth oak within. Extracting her hand, she said, Empty. The woman's brows lifted in a charming flirt, and she closed the wood top with a firm snap, then passed her hand over the top before opening it again. Are you certain? Delighted and curious, Cecily reached inside, her breath catching as she removed the small silver oval inside. Turning the portrait over in her hands, she tilted it to the light. Surprise came. It's me! She inclined her head. So, you know it was meant for you. The interception, the machination, the manoeuvring, the way her path had been charted that evening, her fingers tightened on the little portrait, the silver frame biting into her skin. But why? As though she heard the question, the magician passed another wave over the empty box, tilted it toward her. Cecily reached inside, heart in her throat, breath coming fast. Here, now, everything was to change. At first she thought it was empty again, her fingertips stroking over the smooth wood, seeking, finding. She extracted a small ecru card, held it to the light. An ornate bell inked on one side, a Mayfair address in the lower left corner. She flipped it over, the strong, sure script searing through her. Not this path, Cecily. We've a better one. Come and see me, Duchess. Chapter One South Audley Street, Mayfair The London home of the Duchess of Treviscan Two years later It's as though one is watching a carriage accident. Lady Cecily Talbot stood behind the refreshment table at the Duchess of Treviscan's autumn ball, contemplating the teeming mass of aristocrats and happily commentating for her friend and hostess. Indeed, Cecily had trouble looking away from the throngs of frocks, each one unique and dreadful in its own way. It was 1838, and while ladies of the aristocracy had at long last been blessed with unabashedly plunging necklines and tight boned bodices, two of Cecily's favourite things, anyone in a dress was simultaneously cursed with lace and frippery and haberdashery, brightly coloured ribbons and flowers piled high, like a tiered cake at court. Cecily nodded toward an unfortunate debutante, lost in a sea of patterned grenadine gauze. That one looks as though she's been upholstered in my mother's bedchamber curtains. She tutted her disapproval. I take it back. It is not one carriage accident. It is a ballroom full of them. History will surely judge us harshly for these fashions. Would we say fashions? At her right elbow, the Duchess of Treviscan, Mayfair's most beloved hostess, though not a single member of the aristocracy would ever admit it, brushed an invisible speck from her stunning fitted sapphire bodice, fully lacking in frippery, pursed her boldly stained lips and surveyed the crush of people with a discerning eye. The only explanation is that the new queen loathes her sex, else why would she choose to make these the styles of the day? The goal is clearly to make us all look atrocious. Look at that one! Cecily pointed to a particularly unfortunate bonnet, an oversized oval creation that encircled a young woman's face in an effect that could only be described as clam-like, complete with layers and layers of pink lace and feathers. It's as though she's being reborn. The Duchess coughed, sputtering her champagne. Good God, Cecily! Cecily looked to her the portrait of innocence. Show me the untruth. When the Duchess could do no such thing... Cecily added, I'm going to have my modiste send that poor thing something that makes her look gorgeous, along with an invitation for a bonnet burning. A chuckle, followed by, her mother will never allow you near her. That much was true. 
Cecily had never been beloved by aristocratic mothers, and not only because she refused to wear the fashions of the season. Her beautiful mauve silk aside, Cecily was universally terrifying to the aristocracy for additional, hopefully much more unsettling reasons. Yes, she was the daughter of a coal miner turned earl and a fairly crass and somewhat difficult woman who'd never found welcome in London society, but that wasn't it either. No, Cecily's particular fearsomeness came with being 30 years old, unmarried, rich and a woman, and worse, all those things without shame. She had never taken herself up to a high shelf to live out her days. She hadn't even taken herself off to the country. Instead, she took herself to balls, in low-cut bone silks that looked decidedly unlike pastry, without bonnets made for either debutantes or spinsters. And that made her the most dangerous of all the dangerous daughters of the Earl of White. What an irony that was, as Queen Victoria sat upon her throne not a half mile from Mayfair, all while the aristocracy trembled in fear of women who refused to be packed up and sent away when they grew too old, refused to marry, or showed no interest in the rules and regulations of the titled world. And Cecily had no interest in the proper prescribed universe of the aristocracy. Not when there was so much of the rest of the world to live in, to change. Perhaps, years ago, when she and her sisters had arrived in London with soot in their hair and the North Country in their accent, she might have been able to be shamed. But years of scornful looks and cutting remarks had taught Cecily that society's judgment either snuffed the light from its brightest stars or made it burn brighter. And she'd made her choice. Which was why the Duchess of Treviscan had summoned her here to South Audley Street two years earlier, and offered Cecily something more than a pressed silk frock and a perfect coiffeur. Oh, Cecily still had those things. She knew armour when she saw it. But when she donned that dress, it was as likely that she was headed to a dark corner of Covent Garden as it was that she was headed to a glittering ballroom in Mayfair. It was in the dark corners, after all, that Cecily made her mark alongside a team of other women she'd soon counted as friends, brought together by the Duchess. Married too young to a hermit duke, who preferred the isolation of his estate in the Scilly Isles, the Duchess of Treviscan refused to while away her youth in similar isolation, and instead chose to live in town, in one of London's most extravagant homes. As for what she did there, what the duke did not know would not hurt him, she liked to say. What the Duke did not know, the rest of London did, however. When it came to scandal, the woman referred to simply as the Duchess outranked them all. The promise of scandal brought London's finest to the Duchess's parties. They adored the way she wielded her title and offered the illusion of propriety, the promise of gossip to be whispered about the following morning, and the hope that those in attendance might be able to claim proximity to scandal, humanity's most valued currency. But valuing scandal did not mean mothers liked their daughters too close to those who caused it. And so Cecily would never have the chance to burn the bonnets of the battalion of debutantes twirling through the massive gilded ballroom. It's a pity that, she said to her friend, but never fear. I shall send the gift anonymously. I shall be fairy godmother to the hideous fashion plates of 1838, whether or not their mothers have me round to tea. You've your work cut out for you. Every fashion place of 1838 is hideous. Then it is lucky I'm rich and idle. Not so idle tonight, came the soft reply, and Cecily's gaze was instantly across the room, where a blonde head stood above the rest of the revellers. No bonnet, but deserving destruction nonetheless. How long before the message is delivered? Cecily asked. The Duchess sipped at her champagne, pointedly avoiding Cecily's focus. Not long now. My staff knows it's business. Patience, friend. Cecily nodded, ignoring the tightening in her chest, the excitement, the adventure, the promise of success, the thrill of justice. It is the least of my virtues. Really? the Duchess retorted. I would have thought that was chastity. I confess, Cecily cut her friend a wry smile. I'm better with vices. "'Good evening, Duchess, Lady Cecily,' 
The greeting came from behind them, on the meek, barely-heard voice of Miss Adelaide Frampton, shy, retiring queen of wallflowers, who was followed by pitying whispers. An ugly duckling, who never became a swan, poor thing. While Mayfair's whispers would wound another, that particular perception suited Adelaide down to the ground, allowing her to go unnoticed in society, few noticing the way her warm brown eyes remained ever watchful behind thick spectacles, even as she disappeared in a crowd. Even fewer noticing that, in disappearing, she saw everything. Miss Frampton, the Duchess said, I take it all is well. Quite, Adelaide said, the words barely there in the cool breeze that blew in from the large open windows behind them. Terribly warm in here, don't you think? Cecily reached for the silver ladle in the enormous crystal punch bowl, swirling it round and round as she gathered the courage to pour herself a cup of the tepid orange punch within. This looks gruesome. Events welcoming young ladies require right of fear, the Duchess replied. Hmm, well, as I haven't been a young lady requiring right of fear in... Cecily paused. You know, I'm not sure I've ever required right of fear. Born able to hold your liquor? Cecily smiled at her friend. Like finds like, one might say. The Duchess sighed, the sound full of boredom. There's a footman somewhere with champagne. Of course there was. Champagne flowed like water at Treviscan House. I must say, Lady Cecily, Adelaide interjected, it is quite warm. I see, Cecily replied, her gaze tracking the crowd, noting that the blonde head she'd been watching before was now closer to the doors leading into the dark gardens beyond. There was no time for champagne. The missive to the Earl of Totting had been received. Cecily poured a glass of the unpleasant-looking punch. Before she could return the ladle to the bowl, however, a newcomer jostled her arm, sloshing an orange blossom right over the rim of her glass and onto the brilliant white tablecloth. Oh no! Let me help with that, Lady Cecily! Lady Imogen Lovelace extracted a handkerchief from her reticule, or at least attempted to. She had to dig, first haphazardly displacing a pencil and a slip of paper onto the table next to the punch bowl, dropping a small shell-shaped box with a gold clasp to the plush carpet below. Only smelling salts, she rushed to explain. Don't worry, they'll keep. Cecily turned raised brows to the Duchess, who watched Imogen's hurried movements with equal parts amusement and amazement the latter winning out when Imogen pulled three hairpins from her bag. She seemed to know she shouldn't put those on the table, however, and instead shoved them directly into her dishevelled coiffure, wild and precarious as it was. Then she extracted the handkerchief, brandishing it in triumph. It was wrinkled and embroidered in a wild riot of extremely crooked stitches in the vague shape of a bell. Cecily had never seen anything so well matched to its owner. She set her punch down on the table, and accepted the fabric with a smile. Thank you, Imogen. Don't stir, my dears. This from an elderly doyenne on the far side of the table, flanked by two hideously frocked, pale-faced young ingenues, who had apparently never witnessed quite this flavour of chaos. Oh dear, Imogen said, her wide-eyed gaze falling to one of the girls. Truly, that bonnet is... She trailed off, then said, Awesome! Adelaide gave a tiny, barely there snort of amusement, and Cecily feigned deep interest in her glass. I particularly like the... Imogen searched for a word, moving her hand in a large oval in front of her own face. Ornamentation! The girl's grandmother harumphed. Lady Bow Featheringstone, the Duchess said leaning over Cecily's arm toward the punch bowl. May I serve you and your... Granddaughters, the lady barked. That would be fine, Duchess, as we should like to be on our way. She lowered her voice to a still very audible whisper and said to the young ladies, Obviously, I wouldn't like you two to be painted with this company. Cecily refrained from pointing out that the poor pale girls could do with some colour. Instead, she cleaned her sticky hand and stared directly at the older woman, until the trio scurried off, no doubt to whisper about the unfortunate souls lurking at the refreshment table. Do try not to cause trouble, the Duchess said under her breath. I would never, 
Cecily replied casually. I was merely resolving to begin my fairy godmothering with those two girls. I shall have them round to tea. The Duchess raised a brow. You don't drink tea. Cecily grinned. Neither will they, when I'm done with them. Cecily Talbot, be careful, or what they say about you will be true. Of course, it was already all true. Or most of it. At least, most of the best bits. Which, sadly, were considered to be the worst bits to motor society. There was no accounting for taste. Adelaide leaned back and looked to the floor between them, where Imogen's mint green skirts were all that could be seen. Why is Imogen beneath the table? The Duchess sighed to the room full of her guests. Can you blame her with this company? Cecily swallowed a chuckle. Any news, Adelaide? Oh, yes, Adelaide replied. Your retiring room is the nicest in London, Your Grace. Very conducive to conversation. Is it? The Duchess asked, as though they discussed the weather. Seems that Viscount Colford is in attendance with his new bride. Bystanders might miss the edge in Adelaide's voice, but it was clear as crystal to her three friends. Cecily slid a surprised look at their hostess. Is he? Colford was a monstrous bully of a man, pickled in venom and willing to take it out on anyone who drew close, as long as they were weaker than he. He had just married his third wife, the first two having died tragically, with no one in the peerage willing to question the coincidence in public. Like too many of his peers, he had been allowed to relish in his power for too long, which was why, like so many of his peers, he was on their list. But his was not the box that would be ticked tonight. Enemies close, the Duchess replied beneath her breath, as she flashed a bright white smile in the direction of a couple dancing by, the publisher of several of London's most popular newspapers, and his beautiful wife, whom Cecily knew from her regular attendance at the city's most exclusive gaming hell. A clever addition to the evening's play, which was about to begin. Seems also that the Earl of Totting escorted Matilda Fenwick this evening. Adelaide pushed her spectacles up on her nose and shook her head, her red ringlets bouncing. They say she's going to be a countess soon enough. Tilly Fenwick, eldest daughter to a very rich merchant on the hunt for a title, doomed to a life married to a man drunk on power, who destroyed women for sport. Which was why the future countess had come to them. Cecily considered the ballroom, easily finding the set of broad shoulders she'd been watching all evening. Across the room, the Earl of Totting, one of the handsomest men in all of London, who also happened to be one of the worst men in all of London, moved with slow, even grace toward the open doors. A breeze blew in, bringing a brisk November chill with it. Brutal heat in here, Adelaide said. Cecily shivered and met her friend's keen gaze. I was just noticing it, positively cloying. Totting drew nearer to the exit. Imogen came out from beneath the table, brandishing the pillbox. Found it! Wonderful news, Cecily said, pressing the handkerchief back into the other woman's hand. Thank you. Imogen shoved the handkerchief into her reticule and began to collect her dispersed items, hands flying across the table. Were anyone watching, they'd see nothing amiss. Or at least, nothing that was not to be expected from Imogen. They wouldn't see the pill she dropped into the glass of Ratafia. Nor would they think twice about Cecily lifting her madcap friend's pencil and paper, casting a glance at the text scrawled there. Seven out, ten down. Seven minutes, then ten more. Cecily's brows rose at Imogen. That's it. It wasn't much time. Imogen blinked. Do you know Margaret Cavendish, the author? Her madcap friend smiled. The contract is lovely. I shall make thee a meteor of the time, she writes, so poetic. Imogen would not know poetry if Byron himself kidnapped her in the dead of night. Cecily tilted her head, irritation coursing through her. Yes, well, first I'm not certain that Cavendish was referring to actual speed, but more importantly, I'm supposed to... She stopped herself, lowering her voice so no one else would hear. In 17 minutes... I tell you, Cecily, Imogen said, if anyone can do it, it is you. I believe in you. In and out in 17 minutes. 
Well, no one has ever said I'm not fast, Cecily said dryly. A trio of Snickers replied. A meteor of the time, you say? To be honest, Imogen said, collecting the paper and pencil, I didn't get much further in the book. Any more than ten minutes of reading and I'm absolutely dead asleep. Terrible, that, Adelaide commiserated. It was an understatement. The last thing they needed was a corpse in the gardens. But there was one thing that would be worse, for Cecily at least. Imogen, are you able to remember anything you read that close to bedtime? Imogen looked absolutely delighted when she proclaimed, Not a bit of it! Isn't it wonderful? Cecily, Adelaide and the Duchess exchanged a look. Cecily had 17 minutes, but she'd be the only one who would remember them. Excellent. It was incredible that Imogen was known throughout society as an absolute lost cause. Society rarely saw the truth when it came to women. Cecily looked toward the doors. The broad shoulders had disappeared. Can't suffer the heat any longer. On cue, Adelaide stepped around the edge of the refreshment buffet, tripped on the edge of the tablecloth and fell to the ground, drawing a cry of surprise from Imogen and, Oh, my dear Miss Frampton, from the Duchess and the attention of the entire room. As planned. Almost the entire room.